Before this seven-year epic gesture, I made a film with Samuel R. Delaney, uh, which only took eight years, called The Polymath. And um, Jonathan um, graciously consented to be part of that film. Um, and I, when I finished the film, it took me two more years to do the second disc. And then I was searching around for another project, and I thought, hey, Jonathan, he lives in Brooklyn. I'll ask him if um, uh, I can make a film with him. And I had read all his books, and I liked all his books, and I thought he'd be perfect. And so we met, and he said yes. And then about 30 seconds later, he told me he got a job in Los Angeles. Um, so that's the, that's the origin of the beginning of the film. Yeah, and then the process of, of the process it. was pretty peripatetic. <laughs> um, Did you? Well, were you filming interviews partly? It seemed like in Moe's bookstore, which was, is that Court Books in Brooklyn? Yeah, I don't think there's any footage in Moe's. There's a lot of bookstores, but. Um, no, nothing there, in Brooklyn. There, there were, there were uh, but, but interview about my grandmother was filmed in that bookstore in Western Massachusetts. In Waltham. Waltham, right. Clock City. Um, and, and then there's a thing that looks like a bookstore, but is my office in Maine. The shelves are so sort of monolithic. Um, I don't know. Um, and Power, then the, I mean, books, Green Street books, and court books. Yeah, well, you, you, you remember. Yeah. Um, but we were never in Berkeley together. On no. As many different locations as we ended up in. Yeah. Well, it's a wonderful portrait of your mind, actually, I think. And it's like a, it's like a, a sort of mega presentation because it covers a lot of ground and you can plug interesting things from all different eras and different people talking as well. And you said something earlier about the the wonderful thing of having other voices and you'd wish there were more of them and less of you. <laughs> yeah, at one point in the middle of the process when um, I realized you were getting such great footage of my brother and... You actually said that before we started. Yeah. <laughs> The case of the reluctant superstar. It's hard for me to hear myself yammering so much. But, uh, but it was a pleasure for us. Thank you. <laughs> um, tell us about some of the other people in the film. Do you mind doing that? Well, um, so, I mean, Michael gives a good account of uh, the day I walked in this, the, you know, I was 14 years old and I walked into his bookstore and he's still a very good friend and uh, very, very influential in his his reading life uh, became part of my uh, coming of age as a, as a reader and a writer, and um, and he turned me into a bookseller, which was the career I had that supported my early years of writing. And so, in, a, in another sense, I mean, very just materially, uh, I started working in his shop, and that's all I all I did until um, my I guess my third book came out, and I was sort of I was in what I then considered a position to quit my day job. I mean, I had no money at all, but I was also solitary. I was young enough to be heedless about health insurance, and I just decided to, 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 to become a full-time writer uh, at, I guess I was 32. Um, so that's when I quit Moe's. But Moe's was the culmination of that first career, so Michael gives me that, uh, along with just the, the nourishment of our friendship and his his crazy intellect. Um, and then the, it's pretty much family members otherwise. Hampton Fancher is the other wild card, the uh, guy who wrote the screenplay for Blade Runner. And he's a magnificent personality, another one who would make a good documentary subject. Um, and actually, there's a documentary about Hampton now, right? Yes. Michael Almerita made a, made a very eccentric uh, feature film about Hampton, which is, which is good to see. Um, and he's. You know, he's, uh, he's accounting in this, in this film for how we met. He, he optioned my first novel, tried to adapt it into a film, and it didn't work. But I, I had this really magical uh, relationship to the attempts to make my books into movies, which is that they, they always fail, but I end up with these extraordinary connections in the world. Great relationships. Yeah, yeah, just friendships and experiences and, and windows into whole realms.
that I wouldn't have had. And Hampton represents the most extreme and delightful version of that. And he's, he's a really close friend. I asked Jonathan, um, well, who should I get to read your texts? Um, because I actually wanted Jonathan to read them, but he, of course, refused. Um, he said, Hampton Fancher. I said, who? Um, so I had to look up Hampton Fancher, and I found out amazing stuff. Um, you know, at, at, he grew up in Chicago and ran away at 15 to join a flamenco group in Spain. Um, and he was a flamenco dancer. <laughs> so that's a story. Yeah, yeah no, he's a, he's a great story. And, um, you know, this film is 90 minutes. I shot 50 hours, um, which is kind of the way I work. Um, and uh, I have uh, an hour and a half film of Blake, of just Blake. Um, so it's already totally amazing. However, Blake doesn't want to have anything to do with it. <laughs> I mean, um, he's very. Uh, I don't know what the word is. He doesn't. His his culture um, looks down on publicity. That's probably a, a good way to say it. Um, so I, I haven't talked to him lately. Have you? Yeah. yeah. How's his book coming? Um, he's not working on his book anymore. But um, he and I, Blake, that's my brother. He and I wrote a chapter of the uh, the Beastie Boys book, which just came out. Uh -huh. So he's embroiled in um, in in the reactions in the hip hop world to the things that. He and I say together about about that that period. Uh, there's a, like a kind of a Twitter war going on around oh, no. around the essay, yeah. and he's making art still. He's oh yeah, he'll always do that. Yeah. yeah. Well, should we open it to questions? Did anybody have a question? Sir, uh, there wasn't much about your father. Yeah, I think that uh, you shot more of my father, and there there was a kind of one point where he had. But, he, he had just had um, two teeth removed, um, and he couldn't really speak. It was really frustrating, because he was a wonderful human and a wonderful painter, I think. He's, he's pretty shy, though, and, and doesn't pride himself on his, his verbal articulations. So it's also characteristic in some way of him. I mean, this circumstance with his dentistry, I remember, was kind of dumb, dumb bad luck. For, for you when you arrive with your uh, yeah. equipment. But um, it's also somehow in character. The thing that's more of an omission is my sister is completely absent. And she's, she is very verbal and very uh, opinionated. And, but she was living in Barcelona through the entire time that uh, the friend was shooting. And it didn't, just didn't come, come about. But it feels, because you've been, you've done my brother and my father, it feels, if you know my sister exists, it's, it's, it's odd not to see her. Other questions? Come on. Anything? Oh, yeah. I'm such a fan of uh, Jonathan Lee Holmes' work. And uh, just reread Motherless Brooklyn. But, and uh, I can't fathom how how your grandmother could be the inspiration for Hannah. Oh, well, there's a really specific way in which, um, so my mother's, my grandmother's name was Minna, Minna Frank. So oh, all I did was reverse it into Frank Minna. Right. But she, she was a really a, a New York character in a way that uh, um, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not one of those. I think Michael Seidenberg is. But my grandmother was, was really a, a, a kind of a, a figure in her neighborhood, and she exasperated people, and she interfered with people's lives, and she was, uh, uh, you know, charismatic, but 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 also a, a real, um, you know, she was a sore point uh, for a lot of people, and she um, she told a lot of stories, and she was she she was one of her stories was that uh, people would always look at her name on forms where you're supposed to write first name last. And they would think she's done it wrong. So if she was in a waiting room, they would call out uh, uh, for Frank Minna because they would flip it back, and and uh, or they would call out Miss Mr. Minna, and she she had a line that she has happened often enough to her that she had a line, which is that if if someone in a waiting room called out, you know, uh, Mr. Minna, she would call out, she would say back, uh, that's not a misdemeanor, that's a felony. Um, 
But this became such a running joke, and I think my mother was probably so sick of her telling this story, that one day my mother said to my grandmother, you know, probably there's a Frank Minute out there somewhere, and um, you should marry him, and then you could be, you could be Minute Minute. And my grandmother, who was not one to have her, you know, who, who, who you couldn't call her bluff, uh, she flipped open the phone book and ran her finger down the page. And in fact, there was someone in the Queens or Brooklyn directory, I don't know which it was, named Frank Minna. So she immediately picked up the phone and called the number and proposed marriage on the spot on the phone to Frank Minna. So maybe that gets you closer to seeing how she could be someone in that book. Um, but also, more, more sincerely, the way Frank Minna uh, runs that neighborhood by making his rounds and going into every store and uh, expressing his familiarity and a sense of propri proprietary involvement in the neighborhood in Cobble Hill at the beginning of that book. That was my grandmother in Sunnyside. And I would be dragged along making the rounds with her. So I was the Miniman in that case. I was the, the apprentice to, to this neighborhood uh, kind of patrol animal, you know, self-appointed patrol animal. Michael has been uh, forever pissed that he is off in the first 15 pages of the book. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what are you working on uh, more recently, and does it kind of incorporate any of the craziness of the day, including you know, some of the anti Semitism we see oh, in yeah. like Pittsburgh or Charlottesville or even over in Hungary? I mean, all this right wing craziness. Yeah. Uh, I, the subject of the book that I just published, uh, which is called The Feral Detective, doesn't have um, uh, any overt reference to Jewish material. Although the main character, the narrator, uh, Phoebe Siegler, probably is Jewish, but it doesn't mean anything to her. And that way she's kind of like uh, Dylan Abdus in Fortress of Solitude. Um, and. Um, it's a book actually that does have some contemporary material in it because I portray the, the days before the election and the days just after the, or rather the inauguration of Trump. Uh, and, and, and it's also a book about running away from American reality into some kind of idea of a free space that where the, the kind of the binaries of red and blue or uh, west and east could be I don't know, conjured into some new space, which is a, you know, it's a, it's a utopian dream, but it's got dystopia stalking it around the edges. <laughs> um, so it's sort of contemporary, but not in the way that your question proposes. And, um, and then, yeah, and then I'm writing another book after that, uh, which is a, um, I was thinking about it when Michael uh, introduced me and was talking about uh, Amnesia Moon, because it's, it's a, it's a post-apocalyptic book, and I haven't done that, touched that vein in a long time. And you can hear Jonathan read from it and talk about it tomorrow night. Uh, that, not the post of No, the, 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 the Feral Detective. The Feral yeah. Detective, yeah. tomorrow night. At, uh, it, the, right, the, uh, at the UH College Performance Hall, 7.30 tomorrow evening. Please join us. Yeah. Any, anyone else? I love the interpolation in this film of They Live at the very beginning, it kind of sets a tone. That's a incredible. masterwork, a yeah. complete masterwork. Early John Carpenter. I had never seen it until I read Jonathan's book. Uh, Great, with all the yeah. sub, non-subliminal messages. I think, I think there's many, I started this film in 2011, um, and there's a lot of stuff that's incredibly prescient about you know, tomorrow. Um, so it's, it's a tribute to both of you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I like that Fred did the, all those appropriations. It's his own ecstasy of influence film. It's got other people's films gobbled up inside it. it yeah. And places and figures, the great James Brown footage in there. And, <laughs> yeah. It's great. Well, thank you both. Thanks so much for. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me.